Boom. Welcome. We're welcome, there. welcome. We're back to another enthralling episode of Do Jackson a Slub. Well, hey, you know, you say that, but there's no there's no perfect recipe for podcast success. For instance, my favorite podcast and one that Colin likes, the podcast with friend of the podcast, Joe Posnanski. Their two most recent episodes, they are literally opening packs of baseball cards that are literally 30 or more years old. And the first one that they did, uh, Joe wrote about this in, in his Substack, was one of their most listened to episodes ever. It's literally them just opening a bunch of Topps baseball cards unopened from 1993 and then a couple packs from 1980 for like two hours. And it's and it's a great. I mean, I fucking loved it, right? But of course, I did. But it's funny that it's one of their most listened to ever. I thought because uh, uh, I mean, I guess most people who listen to that are probably like huge uh, baseball nerds or whatever. But anyways, point being, you know, apparently you can just open old baseball cards for two hours and be successful depending on who you are. So are those nineteen ninety three cards the ones with like the red backs? That I don't remember, but I know that it's the Jeter, the Jeter rookie card was part of this box. I don't remember what they looked like though. What what were you asking, Matt? What did they look like? Like the red, the red border, the red background. Oh uh, yeah. Or they have like the big goofy letter. I mean, I've got a bunch of like late eighties, early nineties baseball cards. I got like a couple yeah. box sets one year for Christmas. Um, weren't they saying Ethan on the first one? I just started listening to the second one, and I haven't gotten through the the Tom Brady talk yet. Yes. Yeah, um, Weren't they saying on the first one that they were uh, the what what glossy for lack of a better word? I, I can't remember. Like, um, you know, you know how like they used to be just the, the cardboard. And yeah, they, they were like, saying that these were a good looking one. Yeah, there's, that, there that. was like a phrase that was on the box like, <laughs> a yeah. bunch of times that, that they kept oh, talking. Pre- was it premium or something? Premium or something. something yeah, 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 there was. There was a word that was, yeah, on there like multiple times, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you had to you had to um for those cards like when i would send away cards to get autographed i would take a an eraser a pencil eraser or whatever and lightly go over it so that the the sharpie or the whatever they use to autograph the card would stick better like like it oh. would on, on a cardboard card like a just regular card because that card glossy stick. shit like, yeah the marker wouldn't stick on it necessarily yeah yeah so i don't think they had the the background that you're talking about rudy just because I'm pretty sure they they talked exhaustively about them being premium cards. I think is the word that Ethan and I agreed on. That yeah, yeah. They yeah. Used. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got. I I, I wanted to pull because I've got. Dang! Oh, no, that but it's a uh, pinnacle zenith. Okay. Peter I wonder how much there. that one is worth. I don't know, but yeah. it's in pretty good shape. I, I might get it sent off to like um, I don't know what the the card trading card equivalent is, but. For coins, it's called PCGS, where they'll grade it and slab it. It used to be Beckett was the yeah. was like the magazine that did it when we were kids. That was like for the for sports cards. Um, but I don't know who Matt, it, who can you it hold still that up is. Again? Is he's not even in a Yankee uniform? Obviously, no. I think he, yeah, he is. Is, yeah, he is right. Yeah. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. it just doesn't come into focus. But yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, they've got. I'm just doing a a really. Oh, here we go. PSA card facts. 1993 Pinnacle. Uh, price, it's definitely over close to $1,000. Holy fuck, really? Yep. And, and this is assuming it's like in great condition. Is it yeah, in good condition, Matt? The, the, t- the the prices by grade the most recent price was 690 679 the average price is 664 but the PSA price which I'm not exactly sure what that is is 900 oh shit PSA it's there's a there's a PSA chart I'm looking at but it doesn't and, okay. and now all of our podcasters know that I have that valuable card. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's okay, though. It's okay. We're, we're going to start getting messages. Uh, hey, what's Matt's address? No reason. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I keep a stack outside of my binder. Like, I've got a, a 98 team set mm. of the Yankees. I thought that was a cool one. Nice. Yeah. I've got a, I used to love those. A Delgado all-star jersey Ooh, swatch nice. card. Nice. Um, I, got I think a, I have a Carlos Delgado Sky Chiefs card. 
Ooh, oh, wow. Shit. My brother got sure. Delgado and Halliday signatures on a ball. Did he really? What happened to it, though? I've got my uh, special edition, num- limited edition numbered Paul O'Neill card. Nice. And um, I thought this was going to be way more worth what it actually ended up being worth, but... I had a really special edition mystery finest card of Mark McGuire. Mm. Um, <laughs> like it, it, it came with a film on it that you had to peel off. Mm. Like it was pretty cool. That is a okay. top card. All right. It's funny you say that, Matt, because real quick, <clears throat> I have a couple. I mean, I'd have to look. It's been so long, but I still have my cards. I think they're in like boxes and binders like in this. Um, there's this like uh, apartment over the garage at my parents' house that we use for storage. Um, so I'd have to look, but I think I have like a Don Mattingly rookie and, you know, I think I have a few other nice ones, but I remember specifically, um, as a gift, like for Christmas or something, I, uh, I, one year I got the 2002 complete set of, um, of tops, the tops 2002 complete set. And one of the things they did that year was each box came with a special Barry Bonds, like limited edition card that was a specific number of one of his 73 homers from 01. Oh, wow. And I got number 73. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, okay, whatever, that's cool. But I remember looking it up at one point. And at the time, it was already worth like 60 bucks or something. This was like immediately, it was already worth like 60 bucks. And um, I'm sure, you know, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to see the the lifetime worth of that, right? Because like- is it, a, is it a tops card? Yeah, yeah. So it was part of the tops complete set 2002. Um, but I can't remember, it wasn't just the regular Barry Bonds card, right? It was like- Mm-hmm. It was like the specific count of the home runs, and it was like the number yeah, seventy three. It are. wasn't just a regular Barry Bonds, yeah. Right, <laughs> and it was. You know, I'm sure it's not worth much now because of all the yeah. scandal. But I bet you it was like for a couple of years, it was probably re- going higher in its worth, and now it probably cratered. You know. Yeah, the highest I'm seeing for any of the numbers is like twenty four dollars. Uh, oh, bummer. Man. Well, you know, I'm gonna hold on to it because yeah. maybe in another fifty years. Yeah. Everybody will have calmed down about steroid steroids and, and maybe it will uh have gone back up in value. Maybe it'll be thirty four dollars instead of twenty four, you know. So maybe the yeah. old timers committee will get him a plaque and it'll be worth something. <laughs> there we go. Exactly. Now now speaking of things that I thought would be worth something that are not, and I don't I'm glad I mean I, I got a an extra large special edition Burt Ferv card. Ah. <laughs> uh, but this one has been uh bent and yeah, it's not worth anything anymore. It's, it was shiny though, so. <laughs> Man, the joy of opening up like a new pack of baseball cards. Yeah. When we were little kids, <clears throat> like I had forgotten about that until until the recent podcasts. And I was thinking about it. And I was like, man, that feeling was, it was just the fucking best. I loved that shit. Well, so I was at, I was at Target the other day and I literally saw a lady buy all of the Pokemon cards that were in the store. <laughs> Um, and I was like, you know what, you know what, lady, I, I do remember that. I remember looking, looking in the corner for the little stars for the rare cards. And, you know, I still yep. remember my first edition Zapdos that I traded away for three gel pens and 50 cents. <laughs> um, that, that card's worth over a hundred bucks now, I think, or something. I don't know. Really? Maybe oh not my that God. much, but, um, you know, well, uh, good for them. Maybe, maybe we, maybe we emulate, uh, Mike Sure and Joe Paz and do our own card opening Uh uh-huh it'd be be really interesting yeah well we'd have to pick something like equip so for them they're doing like the 80s and early 90s yeah we'd have to do like like prime shit for them yeah we'd have to do prime shit for us like for our childhood i think yeah like a 98 or a 99 set yeah would be would be perfect yeah that'd be that'd be fun yeah we can see if we can find some let's see I, let's uh, wait for the fan mail to come in everybody's gonna either be begging us to do this or or s- screaming you know screaming not to that it's the worst idea ever so well isn't there um i mean i know for a little while like cards kind of dipped in pop like baseball cards weren't a thing for a little while yeah they're coming back right mm-hmm. i'm kind of surprised if they it's, are yeah. it's not baseball cards but there's like there's a pretty big uh like gaming and trading card company mm-hmm. in syracuse right is that right? Yeah, I think so. Like headquartered in Syracuse. So, you know, that was, I mean, that's a thing, I guess, now. Yeah. I, I have, uh, they were younger guys, but guys that I went to college with that were huge. In, like the one guy still travels. He's in his mid, mid to late 20s. He still travels to Pokemon tournaments. Wow. I actually randomly oh. went down a rabbit hole about that 
few months ago. Can't remember why, but Pokemon was like in the news or something. And um, like as of then, and I assume it's still true today because this is only a few months ago. Pokemon is like one of the most, if not the most like popular and highly um, sold of like all fictional franchises. Um, I think it's Nintendo's most profitable IP. Is that right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It was pretty amazing. I had I had no idea. Like, obviously, it exploded when we were kids there for a couple of years, and then I just assumed it was like kind of a smaller thing among some people and continued or whatever. But no, it's fucking massive. <laughs> well, then, in, like when I think it was like in the mid 2010s, Pokemon Go came out and kind of revived. Yeah, I think that's right. all the all the millennials who loved the show and everything, but. Yeah, I always wanted all those Game Boy games and every Pokemon. That's right. Card. Those were pretty fun. Those Game Boy games, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Never, yeah. never had the color ones though. Oh uh, man, I never. We we never had a Game Boy growing up, but I do remember like, you know, being at the summer summer camp thing that we were at, and you know, a friend letting us take his Game Boy home over the weekend or something. They're like, oh my god, we got to beat the game as fast as we can. Oh my god. <laughs> glued to that thing for a good 48 hours straight mm -hmm. yeah my brother and i fighting over it oh who's gonna play oh it's my turn now it's my turn it's my turn <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me ask you both this because my the answer to to my uh player actually already got talked about on the podcast like weirdly enough and ethan i'm, I'm sure you heard this so Matt, as part of like some of the giveaways that they're doing, they're they're raising a bunch of money for ALS and and they're doing some giveaways, even though they messed up on legal stuff and, and whatever had to split it. I'm not gonna get into all that. But anyway, one of the things that they're they're offering is um you can you you can pick any baseball card from you know the packs that they open up except the Derek Jeter uh card because they're having like a separate Derek Jeter uh pack. And because yeah, they got the Jeter rookie. Yeah. Um, and then there's going to be like five random winners and Joe is going to type on a, on a real typewriter an essay on that person personally for the person who takes oh, cool. the card. Yeah, so it's yeah. going to be like their own thing. And um, yeah, you know, just like in the style of the baseball 100 yep. uh, that, that he did. And um, when they were opening up the cards in that first episode, they opened up and they got a Chuck Knobloch. Ah, I knew they it. Spent, I knew it. <laughs> they spent like two or three minutes talking about how Chuck Knobloch would be a perfect candidate. Yeah, he'd be for, great for uh, an essay and how he was so great with the twins. He was then, so yeah, good. I, I revisited his stats after they talked about it because it had been a while. I mean, we've talked about it, but yeah, he was really fucking good. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, if I get to ask Joe at any point, like, I'm just gonna be like, dude, that, that's you were talking about me. You should write one for me. <laughs> Because I'll I'll take a picture, I'll, I'll have to find them. Because my cards are right behind me here. I've at least a sleeve, if not more, of Chuck Knobloch cards. Because I I just used to hoard every single Chuck Knobloch card I could find. I have at least two autographs. Picture, pic, big picture right here above me, like all over. He's still always been my. But do you have the New York favorite. Post where it's, he's on the cover and it says Blockhead? <laughs> oh no was that, that after the the alcs uh he's, blunder he's, he's screaming at the ball at the ump yeah yeah lets the ball roll away yep but then he hit the three run homer in the world series he redeemed himself he was good Funny. so anyway uh that would be my player um who who would you two hope to find a baseball card of and, and want an essay about I mean, you know, 1993. Hmm. Well, they so, but also on the second one, they are opening up 1980 and 81. They've also done, I think, some 87 and 88. So you actually have a decent amount of options. Yeah. Ethan, you go first. I got to, I got to stew. I mean, my obvious one is, is Donnie baseball, of course. And they did open a Donnie on, on part two. I actually remembered I started listening. They did get to the opening um, when I was listening, but I haven't finished. They did get a Donnie. That's my obvious choice. They got a Bo Jackson. I think that would be a really interesting one. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I kind of, some of these guys, I don't, I can't come up with them off the top of my head because uh, there are just too many of them, but some of these baseball players from like the eighties and the early nineties, their names are just, you know, they just have hilarious names and stuff. Um, 
and it'd be funny to just like pick some random ass fucking guy you know and just have joe like make joe go down like this insane rabbit hole yeah, you know yeah. streaks magoo or something yeah you know? exactly <laughs> but but donnie is donnie's the real answer i think bo jackson would be cool um i'm trying to think of other people i'm trying yeah. to go for a, a non-yankee that i think would be interesting and the ones i'm coming up with are ken caminiti or albert bell i think those would be interesting ones those would be interesting definitely yeah, and he's wrote he's written a little bit about Bell in his uh, Substack um, mm-hmm. during because he was on the on the um, Hall of Fame ballot, the, the most recent contemporary era ballot, or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he he definitely has some opinions on uh-huh. Bell already. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. but I've I've not, I don't think I've ever heard him talk about or write about Ken Caminiti. That would be a really interesting one. That'd be I mean, really that, interesting. That, that that would be a tragic one. But... Yeah, well, actually, Jose Canseco that would be an interesting one too. Uh, yeah. In the same vein. Yeah. 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 But Canseco, Canseco's like Pete Rose. He's yeah. like Donald Trump. Like you're just kind Desperate of desperate for attention. By, yeah. Oh, yeah. True. Yeah. 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 Whereas, well, speaking of, Cam, didn't, didn't Caminetti, he admitted to yes. the steroid thing, right? Yeah. And he yeah. killed himself. And he killed oh, himself. Oh, he did. Or, wait. I thought it was an overdose. I thought, yeah. I thought, Okay. Like drugs. I thought, I thought, I thought it was himself, like, uh, but... I thought it was like a speedball, like Coke, Coke and heroin or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, at least I read about, in, I read about in the, the past, season. that could have been a form of suicide, but I, I don't know for sure. I'm gonna look it up real quick. But wasn't he that he was? So he was one of the first ones to admit it, and then I think he also was one of the first ones not only to admit it but to say like, "There's a ton of people doing mm-hmm. it." Like um, he gave credence to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was coke and heroin, speedball. Yeah, overdose. Um, yes. He was. Yeah, he was only 41. Yeah. How long yeah. ago was it? Like 2000, 2004, 2004. Jeez. He yep. had to be retired for what? Like two seasons? If that. Uh, basically, no. hit, 2001 was his last appearance. So, yeah. He had a lot of injury problems, right? Toward the later part of his career. Yeah. I think his last good season was the, the 98, 98 or 99. Um, Cause I think he, he was in the five years, right? Yeah. Up until 98. And I think he signed a big deal with the Astros. I want to say and that's where he finished his career, but that's where he won the MVP in 96 with San Diego. Mm. Right. He was the answer to that, that trivia question one time, wasn't he? That I gave you guys highest war or, or something. I don't know. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Good ones. Good ones. Yeah. Well, what are you well, boys- speaking of the baseball reference, I'm finally, or baseball 100. I'm finally, making my way through fucking finally dude just in yeah. time for his uh his new book to come out this year what's yeah, exactly. his next what's his next book why we love baseball okay there's a, count, a countdown too or something he's writing that on his sub stack oh okay although i think that might become a book at some point too um, the, what? the football 100 i think might become a book also uh, yeah yeah i think he mentioned that yeah i'm at i just i just finished jimmy fox i'm at melot now it's so good. That whole book is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to buy yeah. whatever, whatever he writes. Like it's a nice mix of uh, like, you know, interesting facts and stories and also smattering in some baseball nerd facts and stats. Yeah. He's the best. Well, I also love what he does. Like, so he does all of that, but he also knows how to make like a, a personal connection with anything yeah. he writes. Like, yeah, I don't know. He knows how to write really touching, like, things i don't know he's 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 amazing yeah. yeah i mean the the paternal biography is i i just reread it last year again and it just gives you all the feels for for everything that you'd want like you know throughout the entire lifetime of an 80 something year old person who's done a lot of things or whatever Ethan, have so you read can, it i haven't no okay i was gonna ask a non-penn state fan if they could confirm all the feels I mean, <laughs> I am. I mean, it's Joe Paz. I, I mean, some of my favorite shit he's ever written had nothing to do with sports. I'd have to go and find them. But he wrote pieces for his blog like years and years ago, um, you know, about just like shit that he would do with his daughters or whatever, you know, stuff that's like totally random, just like experiences with family and all this. And and they were as good as anything I've ever read by him, you know. So so if his podcast is called the podcast, is his blog called the blog Nansky? Like the Joe Blasansky. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. It is a good one. You should write it right to him. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, tweet at him or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's Joe Bloggs and and uh, yeah, the, he he like goes by the Pause now or something something yeah. like that is is the the official name of a uh, friend of the podcast Joe Poznanski. But mm-hmm. yeah. we could just fanboy about Joe the entire episode. The episode. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, so good. What are we uh, What are we drinking? I am drinking a hazy double IPA worth seeking. That's what it says on the back. Who who brews it? (laughs) It's nothing, nothing special. Uh, Stone. Oh, okay. FML. Yeah. Fear movie clients. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. 8.5. It's definitely very good. Very crushable. Juicy. Ethan, what about you? Um, I didn't bring the can down. I'm having my Stein. Um, it's a sour from that. I told you guys about that brewery in Connecticut where I got a bunch of sours. Yeah, the airplane one. Yeah, yep. it's it's one of those. It's the blueberry one. Um, and um, it's tasty. It's just very sweet. It tastes like a blueberry candy, basically. Yeah, that's that's the the trend for sours now. Basically, it's yeah. not sour. Yeah, it's it's syrup. Right, yeah. and I mean it's interesting because like Matt, when you and I went to um we stopped at that place in virginia on our way down to collins for memorial day was it uh the veil or what was it uh well well, the first time or the second time right first time i think first time that was the answer the answer and we got a bunch of sours there and i didn't like them they tasted just like juice like this this one it is really sweet but there's like at least a hint of tartness you know if it was like just straight up you know blueberry sweet liquid with with like no tartness uh that i i wouldn't really care for that and i mean even this is a little too sweet for me what i should actually do i can't remember if i already said this last time when i talked about it to you guys did i tell you guys what the guy told me when i bought them uh at the so the employee i like i was you know i told him i wanted to sample all the sours because i had really liked the pineapple when i had tried he's like you know what you got to do is you got to do a beerita you know just throw in take some tequila throw a shot or two of tequila in, pour like half the beer pour a shot or two of tequila in there and you get yourself like a really delicious flavored marg basically and wow. and I was like, that actually sounds really good. I haven't done that yet, but I bet you that like the taste of the tequila would would probably work well with with the sweetness. Probably neutralize it a little bit. You know, great minds think alike. Because uh, a, a longtime listener of the podcast was talking to me earlier tonight and said that they were drinking a coffee stout that was a little thin and a little a little lacking. So they spiced it up with a uh, uh, espresso martini shot. Mm. and they said that that fixed it that made it that very sounds good. good yeah so nice. nice what do you got matt well i've got in honor of their ninth anniversary i've got a beer called over one trillion served by other half a mm. nice fancy label mm-hmm. um, they make mcdonald's jokes on some of their beers because uh right across in their original location was a mcdonald's um so they've they've made a number of beers referencing the mcdonald's sign across the street <laughs> um, but this is a bourbon barrel aged imperial stout with chocolate soft serve ice cream and cacao nibs, cacao nibs, however you say it. Oh my god. So it's it's uh I've had it for about a year now, a year and a half. It was about you know damn time I drank it. Are you yeah. still making a dent in the basement? Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm actually holding up well. I haven't hardly bought any beer at all. Nice. Um, and I am trying to get through I have a long ways to go, but um little by little getting through that cellar so uh it was about damn time i drank this one now i'm gonna break my streak unfortunately because these next three weeks other half's got a bunch of ninth anniversary um releases coming up so this is uh Mm -hmm. but it's freak week this week which is a neat idea they um they'll trade recipes with other famous breweries and they'll brew each other's recipes nice uh then next week which so so to get a little bit beer nerdy on you guys um what's cool and what's exciting to me as a beer nerd is um you're going to have subtle differences right so the um one of the big reasons other half is so good at um ipas is they've got really soft water the soft water chemistry lends itself to that nice mouth feel and that you know hop retention that that really nice hoppy flavor so you're going to get you're going to get subtle differences from differences in equipment maybe different slight differences in process even though they're trying to follow the same recipe and slight differences and stuff like water chemistry. 
Um, plus, you know, the, the different combined brewing knowledge of these different brew houses. So yeah, they're brewing these other famous recipes, but um, you're going to get uh, a slightly different version of an excellent beer. And that's, that's pretty cool. I'm excited for that. So uh, that's this week. Next week is a collaboration week where they'll, they'll meet with other really high, well, high and well-known breweries and um, brew a new beer together. And then the following week is their big anniversary week where they'll, they'll do, uh, they'll release a number of iterations of their anniversary beer and probably some stouts and all that kind of stuff. So definitely gonna um, break my streak for a little while, but luckily <laughs> I've got a good friend in Maryland who's going to split some of those beers with me exactly and in right. North Carolina if he wants to as well. But um, <laughs> I've, I've only, I've only engineered this with Ethan so far, Colin. So if you want some, let me know and we can work it out. Um, cool. Yeah. The, uh, the nice thing is uh, the, the, the shipping rates to you guys are pretty cheap. So um, it doesn't add too much to get them down to you guys pretty quick. So. Also, if you and I see each other that in February, then you can we can just uh, do it in person. We had talked about doing something. You guys were going to come to DC, I think. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we're actually going to be two blocks from the um, DC Other Half Brewery. That'd right. be a perfect, perfect chance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk to you about that later. I almost forgot. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Good, mm -hmm. good. Good. The bad news with all this is so yeah, like obviously I'll go in, I'll spit all that with you, but. Um, a New York Times article just came out a few days ago, um, citing some like, you know, some recent research, recent studies, um, like a big, I think maybe one, one really big one that just came out with some new results. And it was talking about how um, even a small amount of alcohol can have a detrimental effect on your health. Like it's not about, it's not about like being an alcoholic, or it's not about having like three a night like even just a little bit is enough to like start having the bad effects. And my partner, the scientist, she said a good way to think of it is basically you're, you're drinking poison that tastes good and it makes you happy and, and, and that's okay. But that's, that's what it is. And so I was just like, you know, God, we just, we just can't have anything. We can't have anything nice. And then, you know, Matt had mentioned a, a few weeks ago about the, uh, the C word shortages uh, that, that are gonna, you know, probably happen coffee and chocolate and everything. I listened to a podcast about that actually recently and talking about like the, the chocolate specifically and, um, God, you know, just like chocolate coffee shortages, all alcohol being bad for you. I mean, what the fuck? Like, you know, what are we, what are we supposed, what are we supposed to do here? I don't know. I think, I think people in general don't realize in some instances how we're on the knife edge because Let's let's move beyond coffee and chocolate. Let's talk about bananas, mm. right? Bananas are all a clone of each other. Right, it's the monoculture. Isn't that the word? Um, There's a mono something word. That that sounds right. Yeah. Basically, every banana is genetically the same. They yep. found, so one disease can wipe them all out. You don't have other other variants to survive. Exactly. You have to try. Oh, and that's what happened. It happened once before. That's how we ended up. Right. I think the the cultivar we have now is a Cavendish banana. But there was a Gros, G R O S banana that was popular back a hundred years ago. That the right kind of fungus came around and whoosh, they're all gone. Um, so you know, there's only so much. It and for everyone who's out there getting angry about genetically modified organisms, well, what do you think plant breeding is? We're selectively, you know, choosing genetic traits of things we want. But anyway, um, so yeah, bananas could disappear pretty quickly. There's already. Uh, efforts to battle fu funguses um, that are detrimental to banana crops uh, in Southeast Asia, and they could come to the, the Caribbean very quickly and easily. And oranges, navel oranges, are all also genetically identical because it's all the same mutation. That's what all the navel oranges is, is a mutation where it went, oh, instead of seeds, I'm going to start growing another orange. You guys ever notice that? You ever notice that? Oh, it's a conspiracy theory type stuff. You ever notice that shit? You look at the bottom of a navel orange, it looks like a belly button. That's just another orange growing in there. That's why I get the mini oranges in there when you're trying to open it up. Sometimes it's got the little orange inside the big orange. That's just the, the, another orange growing instead of seeds. That's why it's seedless. Navel orange conspiracy theories. That's why people come to us. That's just, that's why it's a genetic come. mutation. And we want, oh shit, that's pretty cool. No seeds. Yeah. Well, that is cool. Like that could happen, right? You know, it's, it's, we don't take care of our our our, our stuff, our cells, our planet. It's, it's where it's gonna be. It's gonna be shitty. You're gonna just be eating like gruel. Yeah, 
That yeah. doesn't New, sound very fun. Nutritional paste. Mm. Yeah. Yep. They already sell it. There's a there's a product in the market called Soylent. Yeah. Basically hey, just, so, Soylent shakes are pretty good. I've had them before. I, I mean, I've had the flavored ones, but it started yeah. off as just just like the a powder or flavorless whatever. powder. They're like, well, this provides you with the nutrients you need. Like that could be our future, people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, fuck but, all you celebrity chefs. <laughs> yeah. But to bring this back around slightly, maybe positively, uh, Matt, how's the beer you're drinking right now? You didn't actually say. This oh, it's delicious. Oh, okay, that's good at least. But I was going to have one more zinger. I was going to oh, say yeah, find another way to fund your cocaine habits. That's all I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> uh, what, do you guys, uh, good, what do you guys think about, because both of you were um, musicians even longer than I was, but all three of us share a love for arts. And Ethan, you talked like probably a month or two ago, like pretty extensively about how how much life would suck if if arts and you know music and and everything that's involved were uh not a thing um have you guys heard about like the ai uh you know GPT? programs out there like they're writing essays for for kids in school uh they can write you songs bill burr got somebody who wrote into him on his show on monday and um it did a bill burr joke <laughs> it was not a good one, um, but uh, and then NPR actually either on Monday or Tuesday also was talking about these things. Um, so it's definitely making waves. Um, the 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 thing that that I've pulled from it is while the AI can do really cool and interesting things, it cannot push the needle. Like it cannot create something new it can only pull from what it knows yeah so yeah yet it's just a matter of time right yeah right yeah who knows how long right sooner or later but it'll happen yeah yeah so i'm, I'm just wondering like what you got like you know the the music scene to me in general is already pretty trashy um and uh yeah so we could you can go as broad as you want but just talking about music in general like i loathe the day where on the radio there are ai developed songs um on on xm radio or on spotify or whatever it is like it just does not it does not feel right yeah i mean uh well so first of all uh so chat gpt is the one that i know of i think that's the one that has been uh, making waves recently and we we've been messing with it here just for fun and i gotta say like you're right yeah it doesn't move the needle or anything yet but it's pretty fucking impressive. It's not perfect. Uh, it has some gaps in its knowledge, but it's pretty goddamn good. We've asked it to like uh, give us little, you know, uh, efficient summaries of like big topics and like specific shit, right? Like I've I've had it, you know, talk about like very specific like things from classical music and stuff like that. And my partners had it talk about stuff with, you know, specific science and physics and all this. And and again, not perfect, but pretty goddamn impressive and and pretty well well written you know what i mean um and i think the interesting thing uh kyle about what you're saying about that potential future i mean philosophically yeah i hate that idea but realistically speaking at some point i think what it'll it might not be in our lives uh, or might it might i don't know but at some point so it might be that the first time that ai is creating art like that or whatever that it's clear that we can tell right that it's like okay this is cool, but like we can tell that it, that a computer did this, but that won't always be the case. Like it's going to eventually be the case, whether it's in 50 years or 200 years or 25 years, it's going to be the case where AI is going to be able to create art and it's going to be able to create art that is indistinguishable from art created by humans. We will not be able to tell if there was a double blind test, we would not be able to tell. It, like, it that, already that will happen. Art. Okay. Yeah. And like so, that shit will happen. John Oliver did well i guess i should say ai generated images john oliver did an interesting episode on yeah that. i saw that um and oh, it, yeah. the 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 result was like a series of comics of john oliver falling in love and marrying a giant cabbage <laughs> um, but it was all done with ai art generated uh, you know feeds and yeah it's, you're right you can distinguish it now ethan you're correct but there's going to be a day when he can't yeah and that's that's a little terrifying yeah i mean so here's like the the thing that's interesting right is so um 
my my housemate is is uh, is um a passionate chess player right and and i'm sort of fascinated by the world of chess and the culture of chess and so i've like read about it a little bit just because it's it's so interesting it's like this massive universe unto itself right and there's tons of history and blah 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 blah, blah. <clears throat> chess there are more potential moves like more potential results in a game of chess than there are atoms in the universe um this is true you can look it up like it's like there's like atoms in the universe it's like 10 to the 78th power and chess moves it's like 10 to the 90th power or something right um so we're talking about like unfathomable no numbers of course right it's 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 really incredible there was a computer ai that beat the greatest chess player in the world Deep back blue. in like yeah back in like 1997 yeah, in the late 90s that happened, I believe, right, Matt? Deep Blue, yeah. I think that was in like 1997. So, I mean, think about how far, it's, that's 26 years ago. Think about how far technology has come since then. And chess is like this insanely complex thing with like so many, uh, so many options, right? This really, really deep game. And there was already a computer that could beat the best players in the world handily. I don't even think it was close. Um, or maybe some of the games were close, but I know that it like, at some points it like destroyed the best players. And, and so it's just like these things, these machines are just capable of, of just stuff. That's, that's just really wild to us that we aren't really 100% capable of, of, of grasping. I don't think, you know, um, obviously the art question, the creation question is, is something a little bit different, right. But, but still it's, it's pretty fascinating to sort of to contemplate all of that, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I just figured we were talking about that. random I shit. Forgot how we got here. So, yeah. <laughs> John Oliver, um, computers making art. Um, we were talking about the the you e and we're talking about the coffee and the and yeah the shortages, music, right? bananas, Mono cultures, music. AI, <laughs> me awards. talking a few weeks ago about how like if all artists went on strike, everybody's life would suck. I for one welcome our new AI overlords. Oh, I do too. Yeah, you know. The Simpsons joke right there, but <laughs> yeah. there's that's there's this TV show that's one of my favorites of all time, and it's not super super well known. It ran for five seasons on CBS, but it's called Person of Interest, and it deals with all of this. It it, it goes into it really. It's it's by um uh Christopher Nolan's brother. You know the Nolan brothers often work together. His brother Jonathan Nolan is is the one who like kind of created and ran this show, and it's fucking amazing. And um. On the surface, it's just like a procedural, right? It's just kind of like a, a bit of a crime procedural a little bit. Um, but it like goes into all of this, like all of the technological implications of, of you know, AIs and super intelligence and, and super intelligences and, and things like that. And uh, I mean, it's, it's scary, right? There's definitely some, there's definitely some scary, some scary bits to it. But I mean, at this point, like, this is like a runaway fucking train. Like, are we stopping this shit at this point? Like, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we could if we wanted to, yeah. you know? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. But do you guys have anything you want? I have, I have two things that I would love to talk about, but do you, do you guys have anything before we get to those? Oh, I have one random question that I thought about today. This won't take long. This is like pretty much a yes or no uh, question. <laughs> um, so you guys know, but I'll give the background here. <clears throat> You guys know, Colin especially knows, I don't know if I've ranted about it as much uh, with Matt, but but I think you both know that I have long um, disparaged the ability of athletes to come up with nicknames for each other, um, which is to say that basically they take their last name and they shorten it and they add either a Y or an S. Sir Niggs, Rudy. Uh, and I mean, these examples are, or I guess if you have somebody like Jeter, it becomes Jeet. Right. So that's one exception. But generally speaking, Ertzy. so that's what I was going to ask. If I had played high school sports, would I have been Ertzy? <laughs> uh, maybe you've been Curly. <laughs> yeah, just because of the fro. What if, but if I didn't have a big fro, it would have been Ertzy, right? Probably. I mean, coaches are known for many, excelling at many things. Uh -huh. um, Nicknames is not one of them. Language. Yeah, <laughs> it is not one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but is it always from the coaches? I always assumed that a lot of it is just teammates for each other. They do that. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like Rudy is just easy to like every like Rudy is just easy to say, right? Yeah. 
the problem, see, the problem is when you have two roots on the team, like my brother and I are on the same football team, then 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 Rudy doesn't work. Mm. Right? Because yeah, you say Rudy get in the game, that doesn't work. Colin, did you watch Shorzy? Not yet. Oh, you gotta watch I did Shorzy. watch the latest season of um Letter Kenny. Letter Kenny. Yeah, yeah, me too. Okay, so Shorzy is a Letter Kenny spinoff and, and it's about a hockey team, and without giving too much away, there are three gyms on the team. And they all refuse to do nicknames. They're all just Jim. So every time, every time they get like uh, uh, talked to, the captain of the team or whatever is like Jim. And the first Jim's like, "Yep, Jim." And the second Jim's like, "Yeah, okay." And the third Jim is like, he'll say a little bit more. He'll be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, cool, sounds good" or whatever. But it's like just Jim, Jim, Jim. And uh, I thought that was fun. I'm sure that that wouldn't actually work in real life. But uh, what did they do for your case, Matt? Yeah, did I was just going to ask. You guys Matt, did what, play what together, you didn't you? Uh, we came Little Root and Big Root. Little Root and Big Root. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not as easy as Rudy. Yeah. You, I would do like Rudy or and Rudy and Rootsy. Or Rudy Tootie and Rudy, maybe? No, no, no. You got to just, I mean, again, these are football coaches that want to get the message across as quick as possible. Yeah. And as clear yeah. as possible. Yeah. So now, was I Little Root or was I Big Root? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Poor Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Brother uh, Dave. <laughs> uh huh. Well, it depends. How would so this was Spataro at the time, right? So was he thinking about size or was he thinking about age? Or did he not even know who was older and who was younger? <laughs> <laughs> My guess is you were little root. No, I was big root. Damn. Yeah. All right. Because wouldn't Dave have been on the team before you or no? What did, what position well, did Dave play? Well, that, that again, that was a problem. So um I got I played half the season my sophomore year on the varsity team. And at that point, I they, they had me on the team because I could play every line position. I I, I was the smallest, but I would, could remember all the the guard or all the assignments for center guard tackle. But by the time I got to my sophomore year or my junior, year and Dave was a senior, that's when I switched to fullback and linebacker. Yeah, Dave was a fullback and a linebacker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dang. I did so, not remember this. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I. Wait, wait, so here's the, the the thing that's stuck, sunk, stuck, sucked. I can't talk. That's strong beer. Um, <laughs> Dave was the better ball carrier, and Dave was the better linebacker. Really? But I had forty pounds on him and was faster. Yeah. And that's really what it became. Like, yeah, I could block. I could block a lot better than him. I was a lineman forever. But in terms of actually running with the ball, um, Dave was much, much better. He was shifty. Um, and, and that was the, kind of the tough part is he never really got a shot because he was he was smaller. Yeah. But like, uh, I mean, I think I think in ninth grade, he averaged something something ridiculous, like eight or nine yards a carry. Wow. Um, yeah. And the game that he finally got significant carries, it was toward the end of the season in his ninth grade year. And he had something like, you know, eight or nine carries in the game and was doing really well. It's when he broke his collarbone. Mm. So uh, he kind of got cut off to begin with. And again, same thing as a linebacker. He, I had, I had no instincts as a linebacker, right? I would, my, I could do the keys and reads, which for the non-football folks is essentially looking at specific players and trying to figure out instantly what the play is going on. But I was much slower at that. He was a much faster processor of what was going on and had better instincts that's why if you guys remember um you guys remember ray ellsworth yep uh smallest linebacker on the team by a good 50 or 60 pounds but by far the best and the fastest in terms of reading and flying to the ball he was uh he was not fun to try and block when we were doing inner squad inner squad challenge because again I, I i had at that time probably 70 pounds on him but he was so fast to the ball that it was just it was impossible to get to him he was he was already figuring out the play so wow. that's the interesting part of the game anyway that's cool I think ray i think ray's living down here in yeah. charlotte right yeah. with his high school uh yeah Julian. high school sweetheart they got a nice family yeah. i miss him yeah yeah he was a little things. um i'd say ray if you're listening uh Thank you for listening. He was a little, a little wild back then in terms of like, like I was glad I was friends with him type guy. Cause like, <laughs> um, but always a really nice guy. Just to, again, 
he never got the shot that he should have, even though I think he was one of the better guys on the team because he was so small, but he was good. Yeah. Really good. Fascinating. I don't know what I'm watching, guys, because um, it's all in Spanish. The only thing I can read is Lin- Lidum Live, some some baseball game. Okay. And Robbie Cano was just batting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. How old is he yeah, now? Is he like 40? Up. Is he that old? I think he is. Holy shit. I think he's close. I think he's close to it, at least. I thought he's 36 or something, but mm, I don't know. Let me look it up quick. Well, while you're doing that, has anyone noticed? I yeah, noticed that I was gonna 40. try and make some disparaging remark about that. Like <laughs> that had, I noticed too. Yeah, that and that Robbie's 40. Just for you. becoming like some homeless guy's free giveaway hat or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember when there was debate on this podcast and from podcast listeners on whether Syracuse would be ranked higher than Penn State at the end of the season. <laughs> was there? Who prompted us to do that? <laughs> it sounds like a cousin Greg, maybe. <laughs> I think we did do pr- predictions when cousin Greg was on. Yeah. I think I think that sounds right. Matt, right didn't before. you call it though with Cuse? You said that they would lose like the rest of the season, and then they did. Yeah, seriously. So Matt, they beat that. BC, yeah. right? Which I said they would beat BC yeah. to get their bowl game. Yeah. <laughs> very impressive. Yeah, very impressive. Um, Who they played? Uh, it was Pinstripe Bowl. Who they Minnesota? Play? Minnesota. They lost, right? Yeah, they seem to play like the same three teams in bowl. They play Minnesota. West Virginia or Kansas State. That seems to be like those three teams will make up like I think eight of their past twelve bowl appearances or something like that. Nice, but yeah, um, I'm surprised though because you know with your hat, Cal. Notice knowing uh, how much Penn State fans like this guy. I mean, I'm surprised you didn't have like final Rose Bowl champs on there or something. You know. <laughs> Something to try and give it extra importance when really no one cares. <laughs> yeah, it might have been a little too biting. It was a new year. <laughs> I was too mean. I retract that immediately. But, <laughs> you, but you're absolutely right. It is the final, the final it was the one, final right? traditional Rose Bowl in Rose Bowl history. Now, now you know what I heard though? The reason and again, this is silly, but the reason that those that was the biggest reason that was standing in the way of them moving forward with changing the bowl schedule. It's because the Rose Bowl didn't want to give up their the yeah. TV slot. Yeah. We want to be the game on New Year's afternoon. New, new. It's got to be a fuck ton of money. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. The granddaddy. Like, does anyone mom. care about the Rose Bowl parade? I don't. I bet, I bet you it's a, a big deal out that way. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. I mean, Penn State's played in it uh, four times in my lifetime, three times where I've been old enough to remember it and um every time they go i mean it's it's a big deal and it's never been for a national championship and and of course there's the the traditional big 10 pac 12 like alignment there so of course it's it's gonna feel a little bit more special for a big thank you for acknowledging that yeah i was Um, about to say that like counting stats for the ohio state's played in 17 rose bowls well yeah no (laughs) shit like of course they do Yeah. yeah Right, right. Who's going to beat them? Iowa? Like, (laughs) no, it's going to be Ohio State, Michigan, or Penn State. Yeah, yeah. So Maybe Wisconsin on a year that that they don't eat too much cheese and actually are competitive. I don't know. Hey, the Big Ten, Big Ten's headed for some really interesting years. I mean, UCLA and USC coming to the to the conference next season, not not this coming season, but the season after. What's his face is the Wisconsin head coach now. Uh, drawing a blank on his name. Um, he's he's a he's a relatively known coach though now, and they just got like one of the the best wide receivers um, from USC, I think, to uh, commit to Wisconsin, which never happens. Um, you know, Nebraska's got uh, the Penn State boy from Charlotte uh, as as their new head coach. Um, and then there's somebody somebody else that's a big time coach and in Harbo staying at Michigan at least for another season uh at this point. And um it doesn't look like Ryan Day is gonna leave Ohio State. Like big maybe, time. maybe this is a, a 
something for a full other podcast, but at this point, is having West Coast teams really better for the students? Like, right? Is it better? Feel, better better for what? Sorry. Better for student athletes? No, of course not. Yeah. So that's, I guess. It's not about the student athletes. Comes, right? Like, exactly. Well, but I was hoping at least someone could make an argument that, you know, try and try and make a counter argument to the, this is a cash grab thing. No, that's that's all it is. No, of course. And did you did you guys see that the Big Ten commissioner is now the president of the Chicago Bears? Yes, really, I didn't see that. Yep, wow. just got up a few days ago. So the the Big Ten is in the market for a new commissioner. If you'd like to submit your resume, I think the commish should apply for that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I just wanted to point out my my championship gear here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are the what are the two things you wanted to talk about? Well, that was one. Uh, oh, and the okay. second, oh, barf. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second's gonna make you throw up even more, Matt, because Saquon Barkley had himself a fucking awesome game. Oh yeah, yeah, and, that was fun. I mean, like obviously, in my lifetime, the two Super Bowl wins so far will never be topped. But outside of those wins, there has never been a more gratifying win gratifying feeling knowing that Saquon Barkley his two touchdown runs so he went 28 yards on his first carry for a touchdown first playoff carry and then his second touchdown he he got hit in the backfield and then he rammed over like a 325 pound lineman to get into the end zone like it was only a two yard you know touchdown at the end of the day but it's fucking impressive yeah, watching him like run into people is like, I mean, I understand he's got the momentum or whatever, but he's still like some of these guys, he is, you know, several inches shorter and at least like 50 pounds lighter or whatever. And and he's able to like plow them. It's it's like really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And Daniel Jones played a hell played of a well. game. Yeah. But the worry is really that, well. that was that was about as as good of a game as I think you're ever gonna see from from the two of them at least. And you know, they, for they now, they're some, still young. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah, but I mean, that, that was, that was a pretty clean game overall. They, you know, nobody put the ball on, on the ground. Nobody threw an interception. Yeah. The defenses were pretty Im- unimpressive on both sides, I would say, but yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I want to talk about that one Dexter Lawrence bullshit call at the end of the game. Oh, we didn't God. text about that, but we, we can get to that after, but yeah, that it was, was, that was Fucking insane, but yeah, yeah uh, uh, watching Saquon was great, and yeah, and yeah, Daniel Jones played really well. It was it was awesome. Yeah, and I I was telling Toddy this tonight. I'm pretty sure I'd have to double check. I'm pretty sure the Giants haven't won in Philly since 2013, which is honestly garbage considering the fact that that they play there every single season. <laughs> they haven't won a single game. They haven't won a single otherwise. game in Philly since at least 2013. I'm, I'm almost positive shit. that's the year. Wait, is that garbage or does that mean the Giants are garbage? I think it means the Giants are garbage. Well, they have been garbage since 2013. We know this. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Well, and so it's like, you know, either they're going to get smacked on Saturday night or do factor is going to come through and, We'll be heading to championship weekend. Yeah. 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 Okay. But so the Dexter Lawrence call. Uh, so Matt, did you see the, you didn't see highlights or anything. Did you? No, I was enjoying a good football free weekend in New York. Okay. State. All right. So Dexter, <laughs> so Dexter Lawrence is, um, is he technically a, a, a tackle call or what it would. I think he's a lineman. Okay. He's just a defensive lineman for the giants. First round pick. He's huge. Whatever. He's he is. huge. Yeah. A couple of years ago, first round pick. He's like, you know, apparently very good. Yeah. He's um, very good. This is at the end of the game. Okay. It's 31 to 24. Uh, the Vikings are driving up the field. It's, I think it's already inside two minutes or yep. almost if it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. Okay. So Lawrence gets through the line and he gets back to cousins, right? The Vikings quarterback, he gets to cousins. He's already got hands on cousins when cousins just Matt, you know, miraculously gets rid of the ball before the sack. He, he manages to get off an incomplete pass, right? Lawrence is already on him and, and kind of, you know, spins and kind of gives it like a little spin tackle, right? They call a personal foul on it, on him. Roughing the passer. And I could not fucking believe it. Um, and the announcers were confused too. And I, now granted, you guys know, I have not been paying attention that much the last few years. I don't know 
the specifics of the current rules. I know that they have in recent years tried to make rules that are a little bit safer for your quarterbacks and your receivers in terms of like big open field hits and blah, 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 blah. But this just, this seemed like absolutely absurd, horrible call and made 10 times worse by the timing because the yeah. Vikings, we got lucky, but the Vikings could have very, they absolutely, it was, you know, I thought they were going to capitalize on that and they were going to tie the game. Like I thought yeah. that was it. Um, yeah. But like, did we ever find out like the explanation for that? Like, like, why did they call it? Like, that was fucking insane. He didn't hit the guy. He didn't hit cousins like way after he threw the ball. He had, he was on him when he still had the ball. Yeah. And he yeah. didn't like, he didn't like crush him in the head or anything. I mean, his arm like got up around his, where was it? Like around his shoulder, oh, around, just yeah. from like when he grabbed him, but he didn't like grab the, he didn't grab like the actual, um, the pads by the neck or anything like that. Yeah, it was. Oh, God, it was it was infuriating. I, yeah. I was yeah, just so relieved that they pulled it off. But holy fuck. Yeah, Simmons Simmons called it at at, at the time it happened. The worst uh, call of the entire weekend from yeah. from the refs. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think I the fact it. that the Giants won is like definitely quiet it down the noise around it. But I mean, Matt, literally like. He grabs Cousins and cousins moves and then like throws the ball so there's like a, a football movement to all of this and then he dumps the ball and then lawrence just like throws him to the ground and they call roughing the pass and it's like what do you what do you want him to do like yeah it's i, it, I couldn't it, believe it yeah matt you should watch a highlight when you get a chance and and see if you maybe you can see something that we that we didn't see or that the announcers didn't see or something but yeah, <clears throat> just I, I couldn't believe that. But yeah, they, they pulled it out. And you know, one other thing, a positive note, one thing that I saw that was cool. This was also a huge play on the previous, I think it was on the previous drive, the Giants, the Giants were going downfield. And they had a chance to, to get two scores ahead, right and really put the game away. And I think his name is Darius Slayton. Slayton yeah. is his last name. So he's out. Giants would have the Giants would have won. I'm, I'm going to preface this. Yeah, the Giants would have won a game in Philly. <laughs> since 2013 had he not dropped a football <laughs> oh same guy really mm -hmm. for a philly game ah so yep. this is a thing okay so yep. slayton is is wide open in the middle of the field wide open and jones puts a rocket like right into his you know right into his torso basically and granted it was it was a it was a rocket and everything but also like slayton's an nfl receiver he's supposed to be able to catch those and he drops it wide open in the middle of the field. It would have been an easy first down. He had a bunch of open space ahead of him. Run. Yeah. Yeah. He probably, he, who knows how far he could, he could have gotten a pretty, pretty good ways, I think. And, and he dropped it and he clearly was like devastated and, and was so upset with himself. Um, and I would have been the same. I get it. But what I liked seeing was everybody on the giants going over to him and like, you know, giving him a tap and trying to give him like words of encouragement and, and, and Dable, the coach, like specifically, like Slayton walked by Dable and Dable like grabbed him and stopped him and, and was like, you know, and gave him like a pat on the head and was like talking to him. And I liked that. I like, I like how the team, I'm sure that that's not, you know, it's the way it's supposed to be done, but it was still, it was still yeah. nice to see oh, that. Like, yeah, that, that's good to see. I'm going to say, I don't know if that happens if they're down seven instead of up seven. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's um, a good point. I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. But uh, so I just watched the replay. So no, you guys, you undersold it. So it's not just that his hands were Lawrence's hands were on cousins. He was already like off the ground in the tackling motion. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's one thing if his hands are on him, cousins get rid of it. And then the ref says, like, you should let go of him. Yeah. Lawrence is already tackling. But Lawrence is like already halfway through the spin of bringing him to the ground. And when the cousins throws it away, that that's a, that's a very, very, very bad call. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I love seeing the Vikings lose. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything about the game. I saw just Daniel Jones's bottom line stats on ESPN and was going to, was going to give you guys some kudos and say, wow, Mr. Jones finally had himself a game. Yeah. It was cool. Um, it was cool to watch, but in the same, in the same token, like, I can't give without hmm. being critical. Yeah, of course. Um, because well, while Saquon didn't have a very good year, um, I'm just going to read, you know, <laughs> uh, career 4,249 rushing yards, 1,820 pa passing yards, receiving yards, I should say, and a combined uh, 37 touchdowns. Compare that to the stat line of career 5,284 rushing yards, 
23 more receiving yards, 1843, and 60 touchdowns. Now, who could I have just read off? Somebody on the Packers? Yes, Aaron Jones, fifth-round pick on the Packers. Now, yes, Aaron Jones does have one more year in the league. However. Yeah. That's a fifth-round pick versus a second overall pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'd be pretty equal to me. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Just give it some time. Matt, when, when the Giants win the Super Bowl – and Saquon and Daniel Jones are the key reasons why I can't wait to revisit this episode. <laughs> Get through Philadelphia first, bud. Yeah, geez. Okay, but real quick, uh, one one thing to add about Jones having a great game. I saw a cool stat. Uh, Colin quickly met Colin had mentioned there three hundred yards passing. So three hundred yards passing, two passing TDs, and seventy uh, plus rushing yards. First person yep. uh, in NFL history to do that in a playoff game, which is yeah. a, granted kind of an arbitrary collection, but like not that arbitrary. Like a quarterback yeah, rushing that much and yeah. throwing that much and throwing free TDs. You're, like, you're about to get a text from Toddy tomorrow, being like, "That's that's made up stat." Oh yeah, well, but okay, but it's like, <laughs> but it makes I don't know. To, those are all valid things. I mean, there have no, been a. It's a three stat parlay that's never been done before. Yeah, and that's pretty cool. There have been a lot of quarterbacks who are good at throwing the ball and good at running, and none of them have ever th- thrown for 300 yards and run for 70 and thrown for two DDs. Not Michael Vick, not Donovan McNabb, none of these fucking guys. Yeah, and the interesting, Jones thing, the interesting thing is, is like if you could, uh, Matt, if you could just like watch the film of every snap of on, on the Giants uh, side and just, you know, watch, watch Jones. There were only a, a few of those plays where they were like true scrambles to get away from, from pressure. Otherwise they were designed runs and, you know, things like that. And even there, there was this one play, this like really kind of showcased his evolution um, this year as, as a quarterback, he had a, a running lane and um, the linebacker came up on him and and as soon as he saw the linebacker move up, he dumped it off, and they ended up getting like a big like thirty yard you know gain out of it because um, he kept his eyes up and you know whatever. And it's well, like, and I'll say kudos to the Giants, right? Because I mean, all three of us at some point have said that he's not the guy. Yeah, um, he could be changing that right now, and that you know, yeah. good good for them, good for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's so difficult to. I mean, you can't compare him to Eli Manning, right? But um, he's better. <laughs> <laughs> he probably he probably is. Um, the The interesting thing is earlier or later in this season, you know, but earlier, I guess, you know, timeline here a, a few weeks back, I was talking with Danny LaDuke and, um, you know, I was like, I just wonder, this is like when they're going through their slide and I'm like, you know, it works when you're a quarterback in New York and you have that Eli Manning, like, all right, just roll off my shoulders and move on to the next thing. Like when you're winning, that works. But when you're like garbage, <laughs> a dumpster fire, like the Giants have been during Daniel Jones's career. I was like, I wonder, I wonder what like a little fire would do. Like if, you know, he had like half of the moxie of, of Patrick Mahomes, you know, or something like that. And, um, you know, to his credit, Jones is just who he is and he's elevated his game big time this season. And it seems like the team loves him. It seems like he's locked up a long-term contract, him and Saquon at the same time. Um, it, it's just, it's a remarkable turnaround. I, I hope it continues. I won't be surprised if it ends on Saturday, but, um, I don't know. i I still don't understand the direction of the franchise. I, I don't know where they, they go from here. Even if they like miraculously won a Super Bowl, I'd be like, I don't know what they do, you know, next season. Cause you know, they, they have a lot of cap space opening up finally. And, you know, they could get some, some big players and things like that, but they were just so bad for so long that it was just hard to, have any hope and i just never thought we were going to be i never thought i would be able to talk about saquon barkley having a two touchdown game in the playoffs for the new york giants like it's just it's incredible yep what if what if the giants trade for aaron Rodgers? (laughs) (laughs) oh my god or tom or tom brady or sign sign brady Brady. yeah sign him yeah yeah 
speaking of free agents, and then we can end on this. You guys were we were talking about a role this Chapman last week when we were talking about uh, <laughs> I saw Bauer. Um, he's being looked at by the Padres, the Orioles, and some other bottom dweller. The Marlins. The Marlins. Yes. This, is, this is Chapman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he is a free agent. I'm, I'm just confirming. Yeah. Oh that. yeah, yeah. The Orioles aren't going to be bottom dwellers for long. Yeah, right. They, they already were like above 500 this year. They got Buck Show Walter. They have the number one farm system in the they game. They don't have Buck Show Walter. Oh, what happened to? Sh- oh, he went to the Mets. Duh. Who who's managing for them now? It's like uh, a... Brandon Hyde. Hyde. Is that his name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hyde. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They've got cousin Greg's buddy as their GM, who apparently is really <laughs> fucking good at his job. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I'm just saying they. I don't think they're going to be uh, bottom dollars for long. Yeah. God, why did I think they had Show Walter? How long? When was he last with Baltimore? 2018 okay well whatever you know covid happened and my brain's all scrambled i i don't know what happened in the last 10 years just just today i referred to last year as 2021 there you go exactly well you got dad brain you got dad brain though you're allowed (laughs) yeah literal dad brain yeah yeah Yeah. literal yeah all right boys nice i think we did it yep good work he's austin yeah. Any shout outs before we go? Um, um no. <laughs> you sound so disappointed. It's okay. Shout out to the podcast. Shout out to the podcast. Okay. There he is. There you go. Give us give us a meow. Nope. Nope. Okay. Fine. Like, you that was your main, asshole. That was your to shine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. All right. Until next time. We yeah. are stupid. We are going to be preseason ranked in the top five. I did see that. Uh, I'll give you that.